Uh, good evening, dear students, PhD candidates, colleagues and guests. Thank you for coming today. On behalf of the Belgrade Faculty of Architecture, it's my great pleasure to welcome Professor Alessandro Armando. Alessandro Armando is an architect and associate professor at the Department of Architecture and Design of the Politecnico di Torino since 2011, where he teaches architecture and urban design. He is also the program director of the Architecture Construction City MSc degree and a member of the board of the doctoral program DASP, Architecture History and Project, at the same Politecnico. His current research activities focuses mainly on the theory of the architectural project. He is founder and member of the editorial board of Ardet magazine, Architectural Design Theory, and he is currently uh, the editor of Revista di Estetica, 2090, The Sciences of Future. In uh, his professional practice as an architect, he is a partner of the DAR Architecture Office with Manfredo di Robiland and Giovanni Dorbiano. Among his various works in a very comprehensive theoretical field, allow me to emphasize this publication, Theory of the Progetto Architectonico with Giovanni Dorbiano, um, Watershed, a Narrative for Urban Recycle, and in Italian, La Soglia dell'Arte, Peter Eisenman, Robert Swinson, El Il Problema dell'Autore dopo le Nuove Avantgarde. <laughs> his urban house, uh, his urban house with big window in Cambridge, Massachusetts, has been published in Architectural Record, the Architects Newspaper, Domus and Design. In April of this year, from the same point, as a part of a guest lecture series, we heard from Professor Jörg Gleiter of the Technische Universität Berlin. It was delivered with a master subject philosophy of architecture, which, after which he participated also in PhD talk. Professor Armando's visit is continuation of the idea of unbroken uh, intensive cooperation of our institution with important architectural uh, schools across Europe that nurture a theoretical and practitioner discourse in equal measure. Uh, Professor Peter Bojanic and I held the opportunity recently to hold a workshop uh, at Politecnico di Torino with professors from TU Berlin and AS School of Architecture from London. Entitled Innovation in Practice, the summer school was a continuation <laughs> of both theoretical and practitioner effort Professor Armando has established with Professor Giovanni Dorbiano at the master's and PhD levels and reached with the guest seminars held by professors from Paris, London, Stockholm, Berlin, Milan, and Belgrade. Uh, in particular, I would like to say that it's uh, my own great pleasure to thematize and develop the relation uh, of architectural project and architectural project and architectural concept uh, with discussions, seminars, and different kind of projects with Professor Armando. Uh, let us therefore extend a warm welcome to Professor Alex Armando, who will open this series of guest lectures with the important topics of the architectural project. Please. Please. This. Okay. Uh, so, good evening, and uh, thanks to all of you to have invited me here. I'm very happy to be here in Belgrade. Let's say it's the first real time I'm in Belgrade because I just passed by once a few years ago having a walk in the center before going to Skopje for other reasons. So I really don't know the city and maybe in the next days I will enjoy this amazing place. And I know some of you also because of summer schools in Dubrovnik so I see some uh, guys I already know and I'm very happy about that as well. And uh, so I, I will try to have this lecture uh, about, uh, mostly about a, a book, which is uh, the, the book uh, that was mentioned by Znejana before, 
which is a theory of the architectural project from drawings to effect. That would be the, the translation uh, about this. The architectural project and not the architectural design, as uh, Petar Bojanic uh, underlined to me many times, because I mean, I think that the problem of the project or the opportunity of the architectural project is really specific. I define myself as a progettista. Maybe also you have a similar term for saying that you are an architect, of course, but you make projects. And making a project, a map project is different from making a design thing somehow. And I would like to discuss with you about this, if you agree with this and why. Uh, the, the project, in this sense, uh, has some specific issues about architecture. Of course, we can make projects also about something else, not only about architecture, but the projects of architecture are, are really specific. And I think that we have some problems with this also. This is just uh, the cover of uh, the book and of the journal. You can apply for There are a of call for papers every six months about that. You can, can check on the website too and noticing what, what we are talking about. Uh, but maybe we will be, be back on that uh, afterwards. Uh, so let's, let's start from some problems, OK? Uh, I would say that we have uh, a problem about, let's say, the effectiveness of architects, of their work at least. I mean, usually we make projects and they're not effective. They remain on a desk. They don't become something in the space, in the material space. The second problem is that architects behave as they were authors, but we could say that they are more bureaucrats than authors many, many times. They just pretend to be authors. It's a, it's a provocation, of course, but it's a topic also for this discussion. And third, uh, maybe the architects could even disappear in the next years. If you look at the practice and the profession, this profession is continuously eroded by some other figures and roles, engineers, storytellers, uh, big stars which don't do really the architects, I would say, okay? So I, there's a, I, I will try to pass through a series of topics because I cannot go in depth uh, through them because I, I would bother you and we would spend too many hours to do this, so it would be crazy. And I will propose you some of these topics and then I hope you can ask me something and ask me to go back to what you were interested in, what I proposed you, okay? Because the, the book, for instance, is a sort of index of problems. It's a 530 pages book, so it's too big to be, I mean, summarized here. But let's start from, the, from, the, from a problem, which is the, let's say, the myth or the mythology of, of, the, of the architect. Uh, we can consider that um, somehow we consider ourselves, or in the tradition of architecture, the architect is someone who realizes realize the dream of someone else, let's say the king. That's the first figure, first uh, um, hypothesis of representation of, of, the arch of the role of the architect. But we can say that some, there, there are others, for instance, the um, architect could be also in a demiurgic position. So it comes before the king, the power, the de decision makers, okay? And he suggests in the modernism, for instance, the Le Corbusier has an idea about the world and he knows, let's say, how to build a new world. So it, it becomes a program, it, it is a political program before being a project in modernism architecture, okay? And the architect embodies this idea at the very beginning. It's an idea of values and solutions. It's a positive idea. Then you can also have the archi star. Someone is, uh, uh, comes in place of the power because the decision maker, the politician, cannot really decide. So it calls for an alternative. He, he hides behind the architect. That's another figure. Or in the tradition, let's say, now it's a tradition of uh, 
the political architecture in the 70s and the theory of architecture, for instance, in Italy from Aldo Rossi to Manfredo Tafuri and all that kind of discussion, uh, the architects, at least in his uh, or her view, worldwide view about architecture and the world, uh, is an alternative. Okay? So is a, with the, protest, uh, the protesters, uh, he knows that his project is not effective in the world, but he continues to, uh, let's say, uh, insist on it without trying to make it real. This is another topology of the... Uh, and then we, con we can continue. For instance, uh, there are some more mediate situation in which the architect is more uh, modest, is capable of uh, listening to everybody, and then, at the end, he can wrap up the uh, issues, arguments, positions, and translating them into something which passed through himself, in any case. So he, is, he continues to be a sort of black box. We cannot say what he's doing from the, the, the collective different contradictions and instances to the <coughs> outcome. Okay? There is uh, always this kind of linear relationship between what he does and the final result, at least in, in the mythology, I would say. Okay? Uh, and then you have also the participationist architect, for instance, the one who pretends in a sort of uh, fictional situation. Let's, I don't know, we could uh, talk about Giancarlo De Carlo, for instance. Giancarlo De Carlo is the, the most important and, and serious, uh, let's say, character of this participatory attitude of uh, architecture in the 70s. But his uh, ideology of participation puts himself in a position th where the, the people, the collective, is crowned as if they were the king, but actually they just have to follow or to say what is as in, uh, he has in his own mind. Okay? So finally, he's hiding somehow the project, and then this project uh, embraces the, the, the instances, the, the arguments of, uh, of the people, of the workers, interni, and other things. So, of course, it's a, it's a provocation again, but finally the project is, is not made by people, of course. It's De Carlo or the participationist who translates again this in his, uh, with his uh, tools. Hmm? Uh, so the, 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 the architect can also mediate other things which are not uh, uh, people or actors' uh, issues, but they are objective things. But in any, all these cases, I just mapped the, them for you together, you can also say that the architect is a person which embodies the, uh, the capacity of doing something. And we cannot say what he's doing, actually. We cannot explain. Because it's something, there is a point in which something is uh, happening inside himself. Nobody knows. It's a black box. You know what a black box is, OK? It's a black box. There is at least one passage. As long as you try to open him, as the, even if you want to, to include people in this kind of uh, uh, articulation of the project, there is at least one passage in which you cannot see. This is something, say, mystical. So the theory of architecture uh, usually deals with this kind of mysticism, okay? Becomes a phenomenological theory, for instance, or a um, hermeneutical theory. It's a theory of uh, uh, intentions is a theory of uh, thoughts, of cognition, of thinking, of ideas. The theory of the architectural project would try to be something different. We try to explain what can be measured, what can be seen, not because uh, nothing happens inside, not because the, uh, the art of architecture is, uh, is less important, but because it's not something that we can deal with, uh, let's say, scientifically. 
into a department of architecture where we are paid, for instance, for making scientific research and not just to give some suggestion about something that we cannot even say. That's the point. Okay? So this is the first assumption. Uh, let's say they would like to start to pass from that higher figure in which the architect has something in his mind and something happens outside and you never know how to pass from the, the mind to the reality to another situation in which at first you know that there is at least something in, in between. And then maybe what is in between could come after what is in the mind. And third, that this uh, mediation thing, that is a, co a document, as I will tell you afterwards, uh, is a part of a wider network of uh, uh, entangled things. Okay, it's not something that imposes itself to the world. It's something which affects the, 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 the a process or as a network of conditions. So, let me start from some definition. Uh, a first definition could be that what is, uh, what is an architect architectural project? And I would tell you that an architectural project is a sequence of productions and exchange of documents. This is a um, objective or, let's say, materialistic definition of the architectural project. It's not a, so a conception of something which becomes something else and then realizes itself. No, it's a production, a, set, a series of production. I start writing something as I, I, start, I receive, there is an exchange, I receive an email, someone is telling me, something at the phone, then I talk with someone, I send my drawing to someone else, he modi is modifying it, okay? So this is the pragmatic definition from where we start. So what, what is about the production? What is production? We produce what? We don't produce building, for instance, as architects. We produce something different. When we start making a building with our own hands, we stop to be architects. We become maybe craftsmen, very skilled craftsmen, even artists, sculptors, I don't know, but it's something different from the role of the architectural projectista, projector, not that projector, but. Uh, so let's assume this. We make these things, not the houses and walls, okay? So these are objects. These objects are entangled into a very complicated uh, network of implication with other uh, human beings and other things. All these entities act one with the other. So this is the, let's say, networking uh, hypothesis that we use. Uh, we can also list all the kind of productions we have. We can use also some criteria starting from the social ontology, for instance, where, which talks about social objects, institutional objects, uh, describes the document as a specific social object, which is materially defined by, the, by something which records an act, and many other things that I can not explain you so much. But it is about uh, for instance, Maurizio Ferraris, uh, who is a philosopher, who was, was developing a specific theory of documents in this sense, starting from, let's say, the grammatology of Jacques Derrida, mostly, and from, also from John Searle's uh, theory of uh, social objects, even if in a completely different way. But then there, are, there is also another point of reference in uh, philosophy and in the theory of uh, technology, which deals with uh, science and technology studies and mostly uh, the, the work of uh, Bruno Latour and uh, 
in the actor network theory as well, was developed by him and Michel Calon and other scholars during the 70s, late 70s and in the 80s. So this is some, somehow the essential bibliography I, I'm implying in this speech as well, when I talk about documents and networks. Uh, so with, I said uh, uh, the architect produced documents. And then the architects exchange document. Uh, what is the exchange of documents? Uh, I can propose you the f a first definition of it. And the def mm, we can imagine. Let's imagine a process. I cannot give you specific examples because they will be too long, maybe later, from your questions. But uh, let's assume this sort of uh, symbolic representation of, of a process <coughs> in which you are making a project. You start from a point, which is uh, a call, uh, a phone call, a letter. Uh, so you, have, you are in charge for the project. Uh, you start to do something. You start to make drawings. You start to discuss. You start to make hypotheses. Then you change your hypothesis, you listen to other people, they listen to you, uh, you agree, you negotiate, everything opens. You produce a lot of things which goes in different, different situations, in different directions, okay? So it's a sort of setting. This is the first half of this diagram, okay? You are opening something. Let's say that the, it's prevalent sort of symbolic exchange. Uh, then something starts to happen slowly. Time is passing. You have deadlines. You have signed something. You have contracts. You have obligations. And something, if everything goes, because you could also fail and stop and restart again, as usually happens, uh, you start to close. You start to converge. And you converge into a new point that is maybe, let's say, the last point, the last contract, where you deliver your project to, to the office or to the constructor or to the client. Okay? But every time this kind of convergent movement is a contract, is a bundle of contracts, is a network of it's a cloud of documents which uh, precipitates, falls into a final point. So this is the first representation of it. Let's say the this, this symbolic dimension of the exchange is what you can imagine. It's what I'm doing now, right now, here, even if it's not an architectural project. Okay? So I try, I move myself, I show, I sh shake my hands like an Italian guy, and I show you things. I use these things for talking, and I talk in presence. You are here together at the same time with me. This is the symbolic exchange, let's say. Then there is something else. There is a sort of uh, bureaucratic, technical, uh, mute, dumb, odd exchange, which is made of uh, uh, inscriptions of things. Of things. Uh, so we decided to say that in this kind of movements, movements which are nested one to the other, we can describe all the actions of the project in this kind of sequence, a nested sequence of opening and closing actions of exchange. Okay? So this is the first step, the first level of description of what happens when we have an architectural project. But if you look at the same opening-closing movement, we can also describe it as a sort of circle. Okay? This is more complex. I cannot tell you in depth so much. But we say that when we open, we are assuming something. Because we have done something. We have done a drawing, for instance. Okay? So for instance, we say uh, we want to demolish a wall. And we want to make something. Because we have in mind to do the something. That's not a project. It's just something that we are pretending. We are, it's an, an assumption. So in the assumption, in the opening, if we exchange the, this assumption with something else, with the client or whoever, or the engineer, we could start from that. 
if we were allowed to damage the wall, the facade would be, let's say, 8 meters wide. That's an assumption. We don't know if we can really damage the wall. But then, at a certain point, we start talking like this. Since the facade is 8, eight meters wide, we will have to demolish the wall. So something becomes necessary. We want to pass from this kind of uh, uh, structure of our speech, of our statement, to this one. Because this becomes necessary, OK? And when we start to talk like this, we are assuming the first, which is the, the end, as the, as the precondition. Okay, so it's a sort of reversing time. I, I'll be back on this after. Uh, finally, did, so I, let's go back to the to the general description of this movement. Okay, this could be, let's say, the the, the situation in the same style of a description or diagrammatic description. Many times, the same kind of openings, producing a lot of points which be, are translated into contracts uh, uh, and signatures and stamps and registrations, moves to the approval. <coughs> From the very pro beginning and the proposal to the approval. From the draft to the exact executive plan on the final contract. Of course, so we, we are using different kind of uh, representation of this, okay? When you see the red uh, spot, it becomes that I don't want to stay on this slide because it's too tricky, uh, So at least not so much. So you can also develop different kind of representation of this process. You can, for instance, trace a process and try to understand all the documents you are producing and exchanging and try to understand how do they develop. Uh, if the same document or the same uh, drawing uh, is used in different ways, for instance, from a symbolic to a bureaucratic exchange, and it happens all the time. I mean, you, have, you can use a, a rendering for convincing someone, and then you can sign it and uh, applying it to a very bureaucratic, a bureaucratic passage for demonstrating that you are respecting something, OK? So, you, we're using the same tokens for doing different things too. And at any, we, we don't just need to make a network representation because the network representation of actors, of document, are useless for architects. We have to decide a direction from what to what, from who to what, okay? And then we have to understand how all those dots, which are documents, uh, works inside. How can we produce the transformation, the generation of that point in itself? So it's a multiply, multiplied scale of, uh, of networking. That's the same, so I will jump this. Uh, so <laughs> let's just stay a uh, moment more on this difference, difference between the symbolic and the bureaucratic, which is just a proposal, okay? We, we are using these terms, but they, we can discuss on, on, on this. It's not so uh, fixed as a definition. So the, the symbolic dimension of the documental exchange, uh, it's, uh, we can see it as a theater, as in the picture I showed you of uh, Norman Foster or Renzo Piano. It's a theater. It's really a theater, okay? So there, you need some, someone speaking and moving with some, something that has been already done before, a sort of uh, inscription. You show what you did before, but what you did before, it's about something that we have happened afterwards. Hmm? So remember this kind of uh, game with time. Then you have the bureaucratic dimension of this exchange. That, that is something that could happen even without human beings, or at least without human uh, intentions and interpretations. Okay? If you upload a document for a competition, you are doing something with a machine, and that is a sort of exchange uh, that is very important. You cannot avoid it. 
but it's different from when you present that drawing to, a, to another guy. Okay? So these two dimensions are, are, you cannot separate these two dimensions. This is a very strong hypothesis for us. You cannot just say, I'm the artist and you are the bureaucrat, so let's share our duties. It's not possible for the architectural project. So this is a, a way to show you how uh, passing many cycles with the same document, you can show it on, on a theater and then you can uh, approve it at a certain level and then to another, into a theater, then to the other, okay? So this is a sort of strategy that you have to follow. How can you realize what is the path, what is the most effective path for making my drawing uh, real? For passing from the fact that I just thought about this form of this place to a situation in which someone has the power to do something or someone is obliged to do that thing that I drew. That's the point. Very strong for us. So how can I, how can I give the power to become real to my drawing? This is a, a, a basic question. Where is this power? Is in my head, in my creativity, in my capacity of convincing people, in the power of my boss, of the guy who gave me the job? I don't know. In the people, in the particip participation of everyone? Okay? So, we say, we try, we, because this book, for instance, has been written by me and Giovanni Durbiano and other people, we were talking about this. Uh, uh, and as, uh, we could have this hypothesis. For charging of power, a drawing, we need to exchange it. But it's not enough. We have to exchange it and to exchange it with someone else, with something else, and we have to change it. Okay? This drawing has to change. Every time it changes, uh, uh, not, not this drawing, this project, this document, has to change many times. If it changes a lot, every time it changes and we fix that change, we uh, widen the, the, the network of entities which is connected with it, okay? So finally, the, the, the trajectory of a project uh, from the, let's say, useless drawing to the effective document and contract is a sort of circle, many circles, which crosses the world and associates many different things. Let's say that if we don't change it, we have a just idealized project, okay? If we close the circle in the same point. To the, in, reality, in the reality, we assume that every time happens something like this, okay? You can never close the circle on itself. <laughs> this, is, this has something to do with other kind of theories. For instance, uh, the theory of uh, technological evolution and the theory of, of natural evolution too, okay? So there are other discussions, much more serious than ours and more rooted in sciences, for instance, which discuss these two models, which are parallel, let's say, in our perspective. From one side, you have the new, let's say, from the 70s, the new discussions about the theory of evolution, uh, where you consider that the evolution is something which happens uh, in a contingent way. So you never have an adaptation alone, something which responds, a, a change in the, in, the, in the shaping of an animal because it uh, becomes useful, okay? Uh, you have another kind of, of a change which is not adapt adaptation, but it's called exaptation. The exaptation comes from the fact that you already have some features in your body, in your anatomy, and 
but in the circumstances where you are living, as an animal, for instance, you, at a certain point, you can use it for something else, something which emerge from the contingency of your life. For instance, the Archaeopteryx, which is the, maybe the most, the, the oldest bird, let's say, of natural history, you have also in Vienna, Museum of Natural History in Vienna, uh, there is a big uh, uh, thing like this. Uh, he had wings with feathers, with everything, but he didn't fly. And before the Archaeopteryx, all these animals didn't fly. Okay? So the wings appeared before flight. That's the classical example. Example by Stephen Jay Gould, who is the, this, uh, this uh, theor theoretician of uh, uh, evolution, natural evolution. So what, what does it mean? That the, the flight is an exaptation of the wing, okay? And it happens in the same uh, way with the project. You do something, you don't know why, but it, it will be attached to a specific situation of exchange a specific discussion, a specific negotiation. So we'll develop afterwards that kind of a character of, of the program, of the shaping, of the form of your project because of that exchange, contingently. And it will go further and will be effective more than before. You will close the contract, you, you will agree with the client and whatever. So this is an exaptative movement that you cannot predict in advance. That's the point. The same is with the technological objects. Uh, let's say the bicycle, the newest bias, bicycle we have, it's not necessarily the best bicycle. Okay? We could have uh, bicycles, beautiful and very effective bicycles with three wheels, but we don't. Because uh, at a certain point of the evolution, technological evolution of bicycles, uh, things went into a different way. But at a certain point, someone was starting to, to build bicycles with three wheels because the women had the skirts, long skirts, and yeah, the, the two wheels bicycle didn't work at, at all. Okay? So there was a sort of path in which at a certain point, this kind of trajectory was flecting through the three-wheeled bicycle, but then it stopped, and the two-wheeled bicycle continued. It doesn't mean that the two wheels bicycles are better in absolute, absolutely better than the three wheels. Okay, just following in, in the in the thinking. Not let's not discuss about the, the the technological reliability of what I'm saying, of course. But it, just just to let you know about this. Okay, so this anti-finalistic theory about uh, typewriters, bikes, but also the evolution of uh, natural species uh, can be summarized somehow like this. And it's very useful for architects, I think, okay? So the effects of a project are not functions. Uh, the evolution is contingent, and the natural evolution as an optimizing process is a fake news, okay? So what comes after is not better per se, it's better for a specific situation. <clears throat> so, uh, if we try to treat the, a project, I mean, a project, one project, not a typology of project, okay, the project you are making, as a, the, 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 the sum of all the documents you are making and packing together to get the permit, for instance, that you can describe this this thing and what it contains as a series of drawings and information is something that can keep its line or it can move and change many times, okay? So if you, look, if you follow the path of a project from the very beginning to the construction, we see that at any of the formal steps in which you had to be uh, approved, checked, paid, hmm, it ch usually changes late. And it's not just because it, it is a weak project, but on the opposite, because it, 
this is becoming stronger. I try to explain you better this. This kind of trajectory, this is a, a typical diagram used in STS, uh, Science and Technology Studies, okay? So you have on one line the, the amount of associations, of, th of entities you are uh, gathering together around what you're doing. On the other side, the changing of it, okay? So the more you go further, the more you change, the more you associate. Hmm? <coughs> So, how it works, this uh, power of a project? Power of uh, becoming a contract. Hmm? When you have a, a project approved, you need to, to make it. If you have uh, uh, the, all the contracts with the builder, uh, the, everyone is expecting, everyone is connecting to a, a, a compulsory network of actions. You cannot just stop. Even if you changed your mind, you cannot stop anymore. At least, or you can stop, but you have to pay a lot of money, for instance, okay? So there is a sort of uh, irreversible process. It's a sort of, uh, uh, I don't know what to say. It's a, um, yeah, it's a machine. You start a series of machines which work on their own. And they don't care for you anymore at a certain point. That's, that's the, the power we have and that we can use. Mm? But it, it's, it depends on something. It depends on, on this kind of, uh, the definition of this kind of uh, obliging power that we can develop through the projects is uh, by John Searle, is the ontic power. The power of obliging someone of doing something. Or the, powering, the power of giving uh, of uh, allowing something to, to do something, uh, allowing someone to do something, sorry, okay? So this kind of uh, uh, series of connections is at the basis of bureaucracy, for instance. Mm? And you can also say that, uh, for instance, all the contemporary world uh, work and uh, is in a sort of network between uh, intertwining a principle of sover uh, sovereignty, sovereignty of, uh, of decision makers, of human be people, the human being, and of discipline, of technique, of automata. Okay. So uh, w when we make a project, somehow we are trying to uh, densify a series of contracts connected one to the other. Okay, but. If the contract, the, the, the normal contract, is something that uh, connects, for instance, two persons, the architectural contract is a little bit different because it's always referred to a place in the world. Okay, so the future of a place in the world. When you sign a contract uh, for making a project, you are connecting a series of actors with the destiny of a place, which is still to be transformed, but it's there, and it starts to change somehow, at least socially. So it's, uh, you cannot pass through in the same way as before the contract, and whatever. So it affects reality somehow. Hmm? So how do we start this change? What we are doing for transforming uh, our drawings into contracts? Uh, we start from this, okay? We have some, something out of us, ourselves, and somehow we refer to this document between us for re re registering, recording a series of exchanges. Hmm? And then we multiply this kind of, of a, uh, accumulation of inscriptions. And this accumulation becomes heavier and heavier, and we cannot go back. Not so much, because it implies a lot of people. And if we start on the, uh, for instance, I, I could propose to my partner an, uh, an hypothesis, and then we have a, the first meeting with them. We are two, for instance. We start to discuss. We change my proposition. We intertwine my proposition with his suggestion and then back to my proposition, which includes his suggestion many times. So we are deviating exactly as the technical or natural evolution, okay? 
At a certain point, we arrive to a solution and we finish our meeting. And from that point on, that will be our solution. I won't be uh, any more alone with my idea. There will be something new, which is outside ourselves. That's the reason for this, uh, this drawing. And that will be our project. From one to two, we cannot go back. Okay? This is, it is already a contract somehow. And then we make it many times with other people, with engineers, with people at the city administration, with the deputy mayor, with, uh, I don't know, the heritage responsible, and so on and so forth. And we continue to accumulate contracts, money, uh, deadlines, many things, which always enforce what we're doing. It's becoming heavier and heavier, and we have to stay within. We cannot escape from this, okay? So this kind of description somehow suggests you something very different from the mental and abstract process of conceiving a project, okay? Because of course, these documents are made of ideas and uh, statements and descriptions and suggestions and theaters too, but then they always fall into a specific situation which is even violent, okay? Because the power of obliging someone brings always with it in itself a sort of violence, a translation of violence. If you don't respect the contract, you have to pay. If you don't pay, you have to go in jail. If you don't want to go to jail, someone will pick you up violently and put you into jail, okay? So this kind of connection with violence is connected with our power and with our role too. So we cannot just uh, stay on the opposite of this. This is a, a sort of uh, condition of responsibility that we have to realize, not to dream. That's a, a bad thing. I would prefer to be on the other side, okay, just protesting or dreaming of a better world. But when I'm practicing, when I'm making something in the real world, I'm connecting myself with this kind of implication. Okay? Uh, this <coughs> is always, I am jumping this because it, it's again a proposition about how, what I said before. The theater, the theater uh, works because we are playing with time, as I told you before. Before we're drawing something, then we present it. And when we present it, we're talking about the future, the dream, the completion, the, the redemption, which would come from achieving this proposal. But our future is exactly what we did before, okay? So we point our finger in the future in the name of what we did before. That's a sort of circle again, okay? And this is a very tricky thing. I don't have time to talk about this, but it's also a psychological uh, circle which uh, was described by uh, Sigmund Freud, for instance, about the, his nephew throwing the uh, rocket, I don't know how to say, the, 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 the small thing with the, the, the thread. Hmm? So there, there's something very tricky in this repetition and inversion of time, which is at the basis of this. Also Walter Benjamin, in the famous figure of the, of the angel of history, is somehow reversing, not reversing, interpreting this kind of figure in a very dramatic and messianic way. I, we, I would say that we are on stage, so it's a sort of a, a very banal or mundane situation which reflects somehow this, okay? But we are, we are talking about the future, but we are referring to what it was before. Hmm? What we did before. And we change it. And we point every time to a different future, okay? So first we open, and we know that we could have a lot of different futures, a lot of different uh, final solutions. We have to discuss them, the scenarios and whatever. And then at a certain point, we try to close it. But we don't know exactly where. We don't have 
enough power to decide this precise solution for this. And this is important because this is a completely different narrative from the modernist one, for instance, we, where you have a line and a destiny too. There's no destiny here, okay? So how can we make a project a good project in terms of a reliability, for instance, or make convincing someone at least? So we make promises. We make promises because uh, when we refer to the past, we can uh, build proofs of the past, of some causes, something happened before, and we have to demonstrate that that thing happened before. We need proofs. But if we, if we refer to the future, we don't have proofs about the future. Future doesn't exist. So how can we do this? We make promises. Small, weak promises, big, strong promises, which becomes contracts, because they are compulsory, mandatory. OK? OK. So these promises can be different. For instance, this is a project by Renzo Piano, about the La Maison des Avocats in Paris. Uh, if you go on his website, maybe already now, because that's been passed maybe a couple of years, but I think it's not changed so much about this building. Uh, he describes this place in the future. And he says how the building is made, what is its shape, how it will be used, and how it will affect the city around it. There are three levels, different levels of effect, of effectiveness of his project, OK? So the first is about the thing. And he signed some contracts. If I tell you that this is the shaping of my building, I have to do it in that way. That's a real promise, OK? It's a reliable promise, and it's a binding promise. Then he says something else. For instance, that place will be used like this and this. There will be people inside uh, have, with a bar, people with offices, but he's not controlling it anymore. Because there will be someone else who decide about the bar, about the contract for the barman, and whatever. Maybe it won't be like this. It cannot be guaranteed. It cannot guarantee about the bar, about the function. This is the first. So this is a false promise. And then there is a third level. This place, like this, with this function, with these uh, lively things uh, happening inside, will affect the city in this way. Everything will be different. People arrive, the, the, the price of the houses will raise up. And this is a third level, because he have, hasn't any kind of direct effectiveness and control on this anymore. I, I mean, I love Renzo Piano. It's not about Renzo Piano, OK? Uh, the fact is that we need to do that. We cannot avoid to use this kind of different narratives, one nested to the others, OK? We cannot just refer to the to the mere geometry of something that we are drawing. We always have to widen this narrative to many other implications and negotiate on this. So somehow we are liars too. We need to be like that. Because only opening to different dimensions of promises, even those who are beyond our power, we can arrive to that one to the thing which has a power, which, because every nesting of contracts, which is translated into a drawing, into a document connected to the other, which enables a certain passage of, uh, uh, of uh, actions and uh, authorizations and, uh, and whatever, is constructed by narratives and promises. OK? So we have to take this risk and then fix the agreements, one with the other, one within the other. So how can we, th this is somehow, somehow the situation. We, we are showing this, OK? We are showing this with the sun, with the trees, everything's happy. Have you ever seen an ugly woman or, woman or man into a, a, a rendering of a, of a new project in an architectural competition? I have it. Why? Because 
because it's a, it's a fiction, of course. It's a fictional dimension. We accept it. Everyone is accepting this. But it's not just about uh, the fitness of, of the characters in the, in the picture. It's more, more subtle, OK? That, that the same approach uh, affects a lot of other uh, aspects of, of the projects. <laughs> but within that kind of representation, we have a lot of other things. We, we, we are hi hiding inside a lot of other conditions which are being formally def defined, okay? So this is a, a sort of Troy horse, okay? We are passing through the process something because at a certain point we will sign a contract. And within that contract there will be, of course, the image of, the, of our promise together with a lot of other things which will be automatically translated into the new step, okay? When I'm signing something, I'm, Ferraris is calling it uh, atto costitutivo, constitutional act. Up to that point, I have the control of my machine, projectual machine. From that point on, in the future, that machine will work on its own. Even if I change my idea, my mind, doesn't matter. If you sign a contract, you are not the contract anymore. Before, you can uh, mirror yourself into, into a drawing, but after his signature, after his uh, approval or delivery, the, the, the drawing, the project, becomes another thing from you. Okay? So this is also another explanation for this kind of uh, deflecting trajectory of the projects. Okay? So that is, was just an example, but I, I'm closing now the, this messy speech about those, so many things. But let's summarize in two, in two slides. Uh, what can we do with this? How can we treat this kind of uh, uh, problems when we make a theory, theory of the project? Okay. So these these two slides describe two kind of. Uh, questions that should be much more developed in different directions. But at least, let's say this. From one side, we can map uh, all the implications that are embedded into our project, okay? into our drawing. When we, may, when we are drawing something, or when we are analyzing the drawing of someone, when we are thinking about what will happen, with the, with the set of documents we have, we, try, we can translate that set of uh, uh, proposal into all the connections with the rules, with the, uh, with the uh, institutional objects, with the issues and the risks that somehow uh, entangle that project within a specific situation and context. So this is a sort of synchronic research around the project that we can make all the time during our work as a, as a protection as, as first. But then we should try also to define how to connect this different screenshot okay, of development of this action. Let's say, let's assume that this kind of synchronic mapping could refer to a different step of the process. We are starting a project, for instance. Today we are here, in one month we can assume that we'll be there and then so forth and so on in the next year, in the next two years, okay? We have something predictable that we can map. We have something unpredictable uh, that we can guess. Hmm? For each of these steps we can construct some maps on the, of implication, but we can also try to the, draw the trajectory of what will, what will happen from the point where we are now to the final effect, okay? So this kind of mapping, I won't have enough time to show you all of this, is a, is a, is a different way of drawing that is merely architectural, I mean, because <coughs> we, usually, we usually draw things. We draw things, we draw, better, we draw the shape of a place in the future. 
Okay? This is a drawing of a, of a new situation of a, an existing place of the world. But we don't draw, we don't have explicit codes for drawing, for instance, action. But we talk about action. We think about action. And we could develop a different, uh, maybe in the next lecture, if you don't, if you don't hate me, uh, the next time I come here, I would show you something more. But we can draw the action as, we, as a strategy, OK? So while we are work, working on the final shaping of our architectural thing, we can also try to define the trajectories of it in time, in the entanglement. There are some real examples which are very linear and, I would say, uh, deterministic. For instance, the building information modeling is a way to draw the action. Okay? But it's made for engineers, not for architects. Because it's not made, it doesn't assume the exaptation principle that I showed you before. It doesn't assume the uh, hybridization between predictable and unpredictable uh, conditions of a project, of bureaucratic and symbolic conditions of it. So I think that we should try to develop our own tools for innovating the architectural project. Because innovating the architectural projects is not about innovating the technology of architecture, the technical object that we assemble in our project. But it is about how to make things, architectural things, happen in the real world. That's the main thing. How, ca how can we be more effective? How can we be more relevant? Because if we go out of the biggest city global city of the, of the world. If you go out of, of the bigger tower, biggest tower that we found in everywhere in the center of the global cities, or the museums, or the things that we see on, on the uh, architectural web magazines, and there's a huge world made of architecture uh, that no, nobody cares about. And this is, this is our world. I think, and we should try to not take care, to, to do something in it uh, without trying to just to be artists on one side or on the other, mm, trying to uh, imitate uh, the deterministic knowledge of engineers. We are allied with engineers, but we are different from them. Okay? So, for instance, a, a, a concern that I have at the university is what we have to, to teach to, to the students. Do we have to teach students to be artists, to be more creative? Do we have uh, to teach them to have more technical skills? And then, whatever. Do we have to teach students to become good uh, and seductive storytellers? Yes, of course, that these are important things. We, you have to do this, the kind of things. But it's not enough. I mean, it's not the core business. Where is the core business? I think the core business is to hybridize the political and the technical dimension of, of the work, which is a mess, because our cities are a mess. And there are not so many roles, professional roles, uh, which are capable of assembling this contradiction and to keep together uh, the, the, the issues of bureaucracy, for instance, of discipline, with the issues of politics and of sovereignty. Okay? No, no one is capable of assembling different uh, categories of entities which act in our world. We should do that kind of work, at least uh, thinking about the, the special, the physical, uh, sorry, the physical transformation of the world. So that's, that's enough. Thank you. <laughs>